It's talking pints. I've got a it's talking pints. I've, I've got a catalog. I've got to apologise. I'm really sorry, Dale Vince, that I'm not with you in the studio. It's down the line, but welcome to Talking Pints. Thank you. Now, Dale, you are something of an eco-warrior, and you run Ecotricity. You claim that it's Britain's greenest energy provider. And I know that you're somebody that started very, very small uh, with all of this. And by the way, you know, I am not against, of course I'm not against, renewable energies in any way, shape or form. It's the subsidies that give me the headache. But just begin, because uh, I read about Glastonbury, and mobile phones operating off a small windmill. Just tell me, what was the genesis uh, of you becoming a green energy provider? It, it probably was um, <clears throat> the 10 years I lived on the road. Uh, you know, I lived in a bunch of different trucks and buses and things, and I made the stuff I lived in. I made the power uh, that ran my life and stuff <clears throat> using a small windmill. Uh, and I did go to Glastonbury. I built a tower out of an old electricity pylon, got some old train batteries from a scrapyard at the bottom, rented some mobile phones and sold a phone service called Wind Phones. This is all in the um, uh, late 80s, early 90s. And uh, I was parked up on a hill outside Stroud, where I live now, and it was, it was windy. And I saw the first wind farm built in Cornwall. And uh, I thought I could spend another 10 years living a low-impact lifestyle myself, or I could drop back in and try and uh, make a bigger difference and build a big windmill on the hill I was parked up on. So I just set about doing that in the early 90s. Yeah, I mean, you've been doing this a hell of a long time. Now, you talk about those early wind farms in Cornwall. And I remember at some point in the 90s driving down the A39 past Della Bowl. I think Della Bowl was the first or the second uh, wind farm in Cornwall. And I remember thinking, the first time I saw it, goodness me, that is ugly. And now I see these monstrosities off the Essex coast, off the North Kent coast. Boris wants to build more of them. I mean, they really are the most unsightly things ever, aren't they? Uh, I think you're in a minority view there, Nigel. Um, most people think that wind turbines are graceful, beautiful structures, and they appreciate <laughs> for the work that they do, you know. They make energy out of the wind, you know, out of nothing. And... Really important thing with renewable energy, I, I heard your previous guy, Bob, speaking about fossil fuels, and I understand what you're saying about net zero. <clears throat> important thing about renewable energy is it will never run out. And we can't power ourselves completely by fossil fuels because we don't have enough. But even if we could, fossil fuels in the North Sea and fracking, if it ever got going again, will all run out by 2030. That's just eight years from now. We've got to have an answer that endures longer than eight years from now. That's renewable energy. Yeah, I have to say, all, all the scare stories about energy resources running out have always, pre has, have always proved to be wrong as we keep finding more and more energy. Look, you know, my argument on this is that the more we rely on wind energy, the more we need gas as a backup, because as you and I both know, we get periods of time when the wind just doesn't blow. So I'm not fighting you over this. I'm, I'm not arguing that wind doesn't have a role to play. But isn't the point about this, Dale, and, and this is what upsets people. We've had a situation here where, and you know this as well as I do, rich landowners, being paid, in some cases, thousands of pounds every week just to have wind turbines on their land, and the bill for that being picked up by ordinary people. Isn't there something really immoral about that and about the fact no one's ever been told the truth? <clears throat> well, I think the rent that landowners have for hosting windmills is, is not out of proportion to the rent they have for hosting mobile phone towers or any other kind of structure on their land. If you want to look at who's benefited most from rent for uh, wind, uh, take a look at the royal family through the Crown Estates. I mean, I, I think it runs into the billions, the rent being paid to use the seabed to, to host offshore windmills. But look, I think this kind of economic envy type argument is, um, is a distraction from what's really happening. Pre this crisis, our country spend £50 billion pounds a year, bringing fossil fuels here just to burn them. That's a billion pounds a week. 
If we spent that 50 billion building renewable energy infrastructure, we could have 100% of our electricity made here in Britain and create a vast new industry of long-term sustainable jobs and make an enormous difference to our economy because that money leaves our economy every year and, and it weakens us when it does that. We could change all of that. I, I'm with you on the energy independence front. The thing is, yeah. we can't do it with fossil fuels, but we can do it with renewable energy. Well, I don't agree with that. I think we've got vast reserves. I mean, certainly gas. I mean, some estimates are we've got a trillion pounds worth of gas under our feet in this country. Others think it could be as much as two. But, you know, that that perhaps is that perhaps is by the by. But the point I'm, the point I want to get back to, Dale, is, you know, it's ordinary folk on their bills that have picked up the tab for this can. And this is my question to you. Can the renewable sector work? without taxpayer subsidy? <laughs> Not only can it, but it does. So offshore wind is, is cheaper than anything else we can build right now. And it has something called a contract for a difference and, and it's generating under the market price. It's paying the government right now for generation. Solar, which hasn't been banned onshore in our country, onshore wind has been banned, as Bob said. Solar is being built now without any form of government support whatsoever. We're building two solar farms right now ourselves. So, I mean, the answer is yes, Nigel. Renewable energy doesn't need a subsidy. But if you look at fossil fuels, we're putting billions into the North Sea to subsidise fossil fuels. Well, I mean, you know, as I say... At some point in time, there is no doubt that we're going to find ways, and it could be hydrogen cells. I don't know what it is. At some point, we're going to find ways that we'll use less in terms of fossil fuels. But for the moment, we can't survive without them. But I I just wonder, I mean, because it seems to me that the greenest form of energy, the lowest carbon form of energy, that is at the same time the most reliable form of energy, and that is there... 24-7, 24-7, 365 days a year, is nuclear energy. And, and I just wonder, you know, given that we've got these small nuclear reactors in the back of our submarines, that there's talk in North America, Canada, um, and in the United Kingdom, there is talk that, you know, we can make nuclear power stations a fraction of the size of those 1960s monstrosity. I just wonder, do you see nuclear as being part of the mix going on from here? Well, I think nuclear is part of the mix right now, and we should max it out. We, could, we should run it as long as it's safe to run it. But we shouldn't plan to build any more because they take 10 years to plan and they take 10 years to build, and then they take another 10 years before they even break even on a carbon budget basis. And it's the most expensive electricity that's ever been generated. And it's not going down mm. in price. It's just not getting any better. And, of course, we leave a toxic legacy for thousands of years. And we don't know how to contain it. And we're spending $120 billion a year right now just containing what we've already created. So, no, nuclear is not a part of our future other than what's currently running. And we should run it until it can't be run safely anymore. So how do we, getting back to this point about, I mean, you know, I, I mentioned nuclear because, and I understand all the problems around it, but I mentioned it because it is utterly reliable in the sense that it's there all the time. What do we use as backup for wind, for solar? I mean, gas, it seems, is the best and easiest option, is it? I mean, I mean what other solutions do you think there are to that problem of intermittency? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's an important issue to tackle. And what we've got for that is a concept called the smart grid. So uh, right now and historically, we've had something I like to think of as dumb demand. You know, we all just flick a switch at the same time. There's no science in that. And that causes enormous peaks on the grid at certain times of the day. And then we have enormous troughs at other times of the day. One of the problems of nuclear power is it has to run base load. It can't meet the peaks or the troughs. It just has to run like this. So it's not actually as perfect as it sounds. Uh, Our current grid switches generators in to hit the peaks and then turns them off to hit the troughs. 
What we need to do is control demand as well. And that's starting to happen in real time. We can control uh, demand. There are certain loads that can be turned off for a few minutes or for half an hour. We've got grid scale battery storage, which is coming on stream now in big amounts. There are other forms of storage as well, using gravity, for example. There are tidal lagoons that we could build. The tide is uh, predictable 100 years in advance, and we can store vast quantities of water in these lagoons and release it like a big battery when we need the power. There are many ways we can do this. We're 40% green electricity on the grid today without a problem. We can get all a good in well, 10 years. Well, well, on a good day, yes, but on a bad day, we get a big anti-cyclone, sits over the British Isles, and we do have a bit of a problem. Look, I don't doubt, I don't doubt, you know, with what you've done, you know, Dan, you've, you've, you've innovated, um, you know, and this is an evolving industry. Uh, and I'm asking, I'm asking tough questions about it because I just feel we've not really had a proper debate about the whole thing. But tell us a bit more about your company and how it operates, how many staff you've got, um, and, and have you made your fortune yet? <laughs> Yeah, so look, uh, we started in 1995. We were the world's first green energy company. We made this available for the first time anywhere. We pioneered uh, big wind and big solar in Britain. We brought green gas to Britain. We haven't even talked about that. And that, that's a super opportunity for us. Uh, we're working on geothermal, the idea of tidal lagoons. And y you're quite right about the wind. Sometimes the wind doesn't blow. That's a fact. But the sun shines, the tides come and go. Geothermal is like nuclear, it's 24-7, 365 days of the year, and it's just starting to be exploited in Cornwall. So the answer to 100% to renewable energy on the grid is to have a mix of technologies that are working at different times of the year and the day and, and under different weather conditions with grid storage. Uh, but to come back to your question, we're about 800 people. I think our turnover is about 300 million quid this year or something like that. We build about 100 megawatts of generation. We supply about 200,000 homes. And we're here to make a difference. We're here to change how energy is made and used in Britain. And we think we've done a fair job of that so far. But there's, there's further to go. And this energy crisis that began before the war in Ukraine, it's just been exacerbated by that. That shows us there's, a, there's another real economic imperative to being energy independent in our country. No, there really is. And yeah, but yes, but you are also a private company there to make profit. And you didn't answer my second part of the question. Have you made your fortune yet? <laughs> no, I laughed at that. I answered that first. Uh, look, um, <laughs> <laughs> we, are, we, are, we, are, we are actually um, uh, a mission led company. We're not here to make money for the sake of making money. Uh, we're here to make money to put back into our mission to change the way energy is made. And that's the way we roll. I like to express it in the form of a question you may have heard before. Do you live to eat or do you eat to live? As a company, we eat to live, but most companies live to eat, Therefore, uh, by which I mean they exist to make profit for the sake of making profit. We don't do that. We're a mission-driven company that makes money to put it back into our mission. Dale Vince, you've been recognised with an OBE. You have a passion for what you do, uh, which, 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 which I commend you for. Uh, and look, I'm not your enemy, but I just want us to have a big, honest, open debate about energy, about our future. And I thank you. And I regret not being in a London studio with you, but I thank you for coming on Talking Pints. That was Dale oh, Thank Vince. you. Listen, I appreciate being here. Thanks for the beer and good luck, whatever you're doing. <laughs>